A friend says, whoever killed Nathan Wolf must have been a total lunatic. The friend he says this to, Jack LaRose, 23, 24-year-old guy, just days after Nathan Wolf's murder, replies back with paraphrasing, you'll find out soon that he's not a lunatic. Now, who would say something like that with such certainty about a murder case unless they had some direct knowledge of it or possibly were a part of it? Hey guys, <laughs> Steve the Amateur Historian with part two of this particular Historic Murders of Portland series. A potential correlation between two cases. Essentially, in the days after the murder of Nathan Wolf, which is discussed in my last video. If you haven't seen that one, watch it, because it leads you into this one, obviously. Shortly after, it's reported in a newspaper that this conversation occurred between a guy named Jack LaRose and a friend of his, talking about the Nathan Wolf murder. It's a very suspicious statement. I'm right in just the, a major hub of Old Town. I'm on, this is kind of where 2nd Avenue and Ankeny Street just kind of all come together. And I am very bright. Okay. So who is Jack LaRose and why is he important in relation to the Nathan Wolf killing? Well, Nathan Wolf was murdered on the evening of May 1st, 1908, uh, while presumably kind of finishing his shift at a pawn shop he was the proprietor of on First and Morrison, which is, I'd have to guess, eight blocks that way, something like that. So that's May 1st, 1908. Well, May 11th, evening of May 11th, 1908, 10 days later, there is a merchant store proprietor. He's running his business as usual. Reportedly a man walks in. He has a big pipe with newspaper wrapped around it. I guess maybe to block or to keep his fingerprints from showing up on there. He presumably, because it seems to be his MO, modus operandi, he asks the proprietor of the business to show him something, something he has to kind of reach or bend over to grab and when he does that the guy struck him repeatedly with the pipe. He then dropped the pipe, ran out of the business. This is 10 days after Nathan Wolf's murder. The following day, it's May 12th, 1908. There is a man who runs another merchant type store on 2nd and Cooch. So everybody is a little bit unnerved in the city. There's a guy going around beating people with pipes the last two days. Well then, it's the next day, May 13th, 1908. And in the vicinity of essentially the backside of Voodoo Donuts, and it's interesting, they describe this stretch of Ankeny as essentially an alleyway, and it's still kind of that. There's no traffic through here, it's just a walking path. But if I had to approximate it, it would be right about where these two buildings meet. And this is the famous Voodoo Donuts right here. Darken it a bit so you can see the sign behind me right there. Um, and then this building meets this one right here. Roughly in this vicinity where the two buildings meet, there was a shop run by a uh, Chinese group. There was a lot 
pretty much all of this was uh, Chinese immigrants in this area. And as is the reoccurring thing, a man walks into their shop, asks to see a certain item. The certain guy, or one of the employees working there, a guy named John Chow, um, agrees. You know, obviously he assumes this guy's a customer as the other guys before him have. And as he goes to do it, this guy pulls out a big pipe and starts beating on him. And he beat Chow, he hit Chow at least five or six times. And in the vicinity of right here, he did what he always did, he dropped the pipe and he walked out of the business. And it's interesting, he walked out of the business and they say he started walking towards Second Avenue. And apparently he was just walking very casually. He split the business and then just started walking this way very casually. Well, there are, you know, this is a very, very tight community here. And just every sound in the history of the universe has to start happening. But essentially it was a very tight knit community here. And the business where this attack happened, they set off a warning uh, whistle essentially, like something, there's an emergency that's happening. And everybody who worked in this area, all these Chinese immigrants knew what that meant. And all at once they all come out and they're all trying to figure out what's going on. That guy's doing a tour. He's talking Portland history like me. So, this guy who's just attacked them, he's trying to walk casually towards 2nd Street. Well, all the immigrants that work here, they all run out. And even John Chow, who just took this beating, according to the newspaper, he picked up the pipe that was left behind and he led the charge out of their business right back here. And they, and you know, and apparently he couldn't make it very far because he was obviously dazed. But the fact that he was able to pick up that pipe and he wanted to go after him, but he, you know, they were able, there was other people in the building, they were able to point out this guy who's walking this way and all these Chinese immigrants in this area start running after him to like exact some vigilante justice. So this guy looks back, sees them coming and has an oh shit moment and starts running north on second. And the next block up you'll see here is Burnside and Second. So this guy's in some trouble. He is running for his life now. There are who knows how many people chasing him. And he's just beelining it north. I mean, what else is he gonna do? He's sprinting towards Burnside. So the guy finishes his run. He's running across Burnside and there's an unemployment office in the vicinity of this block right here. And it's lined with unemployed people trying to get some help. They see this guy running and all these Chinese immigrants chasing him. And they join the chase and they start running after this guy. Just who knows how many people running after this guy. And he's screwed so he ducks into the Erickson Saloon, which is located right behind me, a place that's of fair prominence in this city. There was a massive fire that happened back here in the 1970s. He books it in there, and once inside, one of the guys inside there grabs him, slams him down, and holds him down by the neck until the police show up. <laughs> I'm just envisioning this guy running by himself and all these people chasing him. It's like a Buster Keaton movie. So who was this guy that was literally seen in the act of pummeling a guy in his own business and running away with a pipe the third day in a row that this has happened? You know, once the police show up, they discover that this guy is Jack LaRose, the guy who I was talking about at the start of this video. And he's, you know, he's in some hot water now. He's literally been seen and ID'd as a guy attacking someone with a pipe, which has happened three days in a row. So it seems pretty clear that Jack LaRose was responsible for all these crimes. And he staked the claim. He'd, he'd been in the city since 
the Saturday before this spree started happening. The first one happened the following Monday, so by his own admittance, he was in the city uh, when all these attacks happened, and of course denied it. Um, but it was determined that he was, when he got here, he was staying at a rooming house in this area. I think it was at 2nd and Everett because it was said to be on 2nd Street and it was called like the Everett Rooming House. So this here is the intersection of 2nd Avenue, which is crossing traffic, and Everett Street, which is the one I'm walking along. And nothing here obviously is original to 1908. These buildings are all clearly fairly new and even the Chinese Garden is not that old but the Everett rooming house was located somewhere here I know the new um, Grand Central Hotel took up this whole block so it wouldn't have been here so it's probably here here or behind me but for a guy who you'd think would want to keep a low profile if he's gonna go out and start bashing people's heads in with pipes while they were staying while LaRose and a few colleagues, guys he met on the road, I don't know, were staying at one of these rooming houses. Uh, apparently the help came up to, you know, fix their beds, clean the room, help him out, and they ordered him out, and when the guy was hesitant to leave, they pulled a gun on him. They ordered this guy out of his own, a room in his own uh, rooming business at gunpoint. Now, attacking a guy with a pipe, uh, John Chow survived. So an attack, an attempted murder, would ultimately be the least of Jack LaRose's problems because on that same day, May 13th, the second merchant shop he, where he attacked the proprietor on May 12th, he succumbed to his beating. He was a man named Hyman Newman. And the shop he ran where Jack LaRose presumably attacked him was located at 2nd and Cooch Street. So it was at this intersection. Now, you've got this building here, Rich Block, which was built in 1905. The Oregon Leather Company, I think, came along later. So, I don't know. It just says it was at 2nd and Cooch. But Rich Block existed when this crime happened so it's possible maybe this is where Hyman Newman's shop was when he was attacked with a pipe and succumbed to his injuries the attack on the 11th of the other merchant he survived John Chow survived but the attack on Hyman Newman was ultimately deemed a murder after he succumbed to his injuries. So Jack LaRose had a murder beef and an attempted murder beef awaiting him. And unlike most of these cases I'm discussing, random occurrences, one-time crime situations, Jack LaRose actually had established a nickname for himself, kind of a ripoff, so not that great. But it came out that when he attacked John Chow in his shop, Jack LaRose actually stated that he was Jack the Splitter. Stupid. But, I mean, sensible. That's what he did. He went at people and beat him in the head when he got them into a compromised position. Some people wonder, was he trying to push an insanity defense or was this guy just out of his mind? Because um, when he was apprehended, uh, he was just, he started rambling about how, you know, he, he made these ramblings about how all the Jew, Jews, that's how he said it, Jewish people needed to be killed off. And of course, the two merchants he attacked, besides Sean Chow, were both Jewish, um, including Hyman Newman, who was Jewish. But before that, uh, something that was used against Jack LaRose in his trial was 
right around the time that Hyman Newman was attacked, Jack LaRose showed up at a bar, presumably right after he would have done the killing, and he was all jacked up and kind of tweaking and crazy and sat down and was just, just looked generally out of his mind and was like, ah, oh, give me a drink, you know? Um, so certainly not voting well for him, the fact that he was acting so bizarre right after this crime happened. And, and it's interesting, you know, his focus was so on apparently attacking Jewish people, but then in the aftermath of attacking John Chow, he, when he was talking to the police, he was rambling, we need to kill all the Chinese. And it's really interesting, and I read this and I was like, oh man, this, I wonder if this is uh, the origin of a contemporary term. You know, we have the term in today's society, you know, he or she did me dirty, which means, you know, betrayed me, did me wrong, so on and so forth. There was an article I read discussing specifically, what the hell? <laughs> discussing specifically um, Jack LaRose in the aftermath of being apprehended for attacking John Chow and how he was just rambling like a psycho racist lunatic about how, you know, I need to go, I'll kill all the Chinese if I can, all of them. And when they asked him why he wanted to do that, he said, and I quote, it's done in quotes, he said, they did me dirt. Not dirty, but dirt. They did me dirt. So, there was a lot of circumstantial evidence, obviously, against LaRose, including the fact that there was no doubt that he attacked John Chow with a pipe the same way these two other people had in the two days before. It's kind of hard to argue you weren't the guilty party, but beyond anything else, uh, right before these attacks started, Jack LaRose had befriended just a random guy in this area. And he said, because he ended up having to ask, as the story goes, he ended up asking Jack LaRose if he could have like some money to pay for something. Uh, you know, I'm broke, I can't really afford anything. And Jack LaRose essentially said to him, we can have all the money we want with help from my little gas pipe. This is before these attacks started happening. Like, talk about just putting yourself out there <laughs> to be found guilty. And he was. Um, but like so many other cases, uh, because, you know, there, there wasn't an actual eyewitness to the murder that could put Jack LaRose at the site of the murder of Hyman Newman, which this was the murder trial. This had nothing to do with Chow. Obviously, the Chow case uh, was significant in showing that, you know, this guy was doing that same stuff. But, you know, because it was a lot of circumstantial evidence and... LaRose, like so many others, was trying to obviously play up this whole I'm crazy out of my mind. Instead of being found guilty of murder, he was found guilty ultimately of second degree murder, which is kind of, you know, almost a compromise in certain regards. So November 14th, 1908, he was found guilty of second degree murder of Hyman Newman. And he was given a life sentence as a result of it. So, I mean, he didn't, certainly didn't walk away from this case unscathed. You know, like so many other cases where they can't quite get a first degree murder beef on it. It was appealed, but the Supreme Court upheld it. It was not a case that was going to get dismissed. And even uh, LaRose's attorneys, their biggest reason for trying to get an appeal was stuff was interjected into the trial that had nothing to do with the, or it wasn't related to the crime perpetrated on Hyman Newman, which was the info put into the case in relation to the John Chow murder, which I think is absolutely essential in this case. When you say we have verification, this guy did the exact same crime the day after in the same general area, and you have who knows how many witnesses to it. So yeah, that was essential information in this case. But at the end of the day, Jack LaRose goes away for the murder of Hyman Newman, a merchant, store proprietor an attack that happened 11 days after nathan wolf is murdered a guy who runs a similar shop and we have jack larose being quoted in this very interesting way say almost acting like he knows the behavior of nathan wolf's killer 
And then on the flip side, we have all this, all these questions about Edward Martin and all this kind of unsettled, unsettled feelings about the case against him. You know, there was evidence against him, but there was a lot of, lots of holes, lots of questionable stuff. And what about this Joe Botkin guy I addressed in the last video who reportedly had issues with Nathan Wolf as well and also split Tamil. Um, but when it seemed like they couldn't quite get something on him, the authorities just kind of let it go. It seemed like Nathan Wolf's case was a, we'll get it on one of these guys so we can get it off our books and get, you know, the community off our ass about getting a resolution for it. But that's not how you, you know, fully solve a case. So the final question then does become, was Jack LaRose? involved in the murder of Nathan Wolf. Was he partially involved? Was he connected to it? Was he the only one involved? It's important to mention there are obviously differences the modus operandi. These crimes perpetrated May 11, 12th, and 13th were all done the same way, gas pipe, whereas Nathan Wolf, it seemed, I mean again they couldn't fully determine exactly how he died but it was thought that there was an axe probably used which is I mean, technically it's a different kind of weapon, but you have to also consider, you know, beating with an ax, beating with a gas pipe. Maybe if he showed up, you know, at Nathan Wolf's establishment, maybe he had, that was all he had to work with. And he realized, I need to have something with me next time. Because what if Nathan Wolf could have gotten away? These are the things you have to consider and hypothesize about, you know, in a case where you have interesting statements coming from Jack LaRose and you have this case of Nathan Wolf that I'm not 100% fully convinced the right guy got put away for it. You know, we have a guy who'd been doing cocaine for who knows how long, was ripped apart from it. You know, he's liable to say or get maneuvered into anything and he's an easy target to say they're guilty. This guy's a drug addict. He's capable of doing anything. So we obviously did this crime. You know, and then of course, these attacks all happened with, in less than a two week period of time. There's a lot of interesting facets to this overall case that make me at least question. I'm not making the broad statement. I think Jack LaRose was guilty of Nathan Wolf and Hyman Newman. I think it's pretty clear he killed Hyman Newman, but the question has to be posed at the end of the day. Was this guy possibly guilty of the killing of Nathan Wolf? You know, he claims to have not shown up in Portland until May 9th, but what verification do we have for that? I didn't see any verification in any of the resources I saw. It's all just, this is what this guy said. So at the end of the day, who knows, but I found it very interesting that researching these two cases completely independently of each other, not thinking in terms of correlations. I wasn't even paying attention to the fact that they happened so close to one another until I noticed they occurred within days of each other and that Jack LaRose is referenced in relation to all of them at some point in newsprint. So was he guilty or wasn't he? At the end of the day, who knows? He was never considered, it seems, really as a genuine suspect. He obviously never admitted to it. It would just be more detrimental to him and his own cause. But he definitely had the ability to do it. Did uh, Edward Martin have what it took to do it? We don't know. So we're left pondering and theorizing, but it's really interesting wondering what really happened and who actually did what. And that's where I leave off the mysteries of Chinatown and Old Town Portland, I guess, in terms of Nathan Wolf. So for now, that's it, guys. <laughs> I don't have all the answers, but I like pondering what those answers might be. So anyway, as usual, guys, hope you enjoyed the video. Both of them. Hope you watched both of them. And uh, remember, as always, like, share, subscribe, comment, but be polite about it. You know, tell me what you think about this case, these multiple cases. And hit up my Patreon if you want to help me out that way. I do appreciate it, and I appreciate you for watching my stuff. I do not appreciate the TriMet bus trying to ruin my ending. Eh, what are you going to do? It's Portland. There's buses everywhere. Anyway, from this... The...
howling, loud, bustling city. This has been Steve the Amateur Historian with another episode of Historic Murders of Portland.